Dr. Ben Lawrence is a canopy oncologist who specialises in gastrointestinal cancers and has a special interest in the pancreas, neuroendocrine tumours and cancer genomics. In this video, Dr. Lawrence talks about how cancer cells work, different cancer treatments, precision medicine and his passion for oncology. It's an amazing time to be working in oncology and looking after people with cancer because in the time that I've been practicing I've seen a shift from chemotherapy to everybody to in some cancers we don't use chemotherapy at all anymore. Um, we've seen uh, people having more and more time, we've seen cure rates going up uh, as we understand the biology uh, of cancer, as we have better scanning, as we have better surgery uh, and better chemotherapy. Um, so it's a time of great hope and um, the big change at the moment is our ability to understand what's in the cancer and match that to a drug uh, and also that we are now harnessing the body's own immune system to do the fighting for us. If you think about our body, it's 40 trillion cells um, and many of those have a nucleus and a nucleus is the control centre for the cell and every time a cell grows it has to, um, it doesn't just get bigger and bigger, it actually has to split into two and into four and eight and sixteen and so on. So one of the things our body's doing all the time normally is copying huge amounts of this DNA code and every time a new um, cell is made all of that DNA code has to be copied perfectly in the same order with the same little piece of the code um, and reconstruct it. And our body's really amazing at doing this, but it's not perfect. And even when you've got such big numbers, if you have just 0.001% of errors, yeah, that's quite a lot of errors. And so our body has ways of fixing that. Um, and those are called DNA repair uh, mechanisms. And so cancer happens when there are mistakes that make it through to the next cell. So um, thinking about how, where those mistakes happen and, and why they're important, the pieces of DNA code and each one of our normal cells is divided up into packets called genes. And there's 20,000 genes in every cell in our body. And cancer happens when you get a mistake in about between one and eight, often about four or five of those genes get a mistake in it. And we call that mistake a mutation. And so if one cell collects one mutation and then another mutation and another, and you have uh, four or five of them that control really important things that the cell does like grow or stop growing or holding on to where it normally sits and, and that, so it doesn't do that, it can let go and travel somewhere else, then that's what, that's what a cancer is. Precision medicine is, um, has come about because we now have a much better biological understanding of what cancer is. In the past, what we used to do was we'd say, oh, this cancer started in the lung or the colon or some part, and therefore we'll use the colon cancer treatment or the lung cancer treatment. But what we realise more and more is that there's a lot of variation within lung cancers or within bowel cancers. And we now know that that variation is caused predominantly because of different combinations of gene mutations or gene mistakes that drive that cancer. And so we've started to, rather than thinking of all lung cancers as the same, for example, or all bowel cancers as the same, and using the same treatment, we recognise that they're often very different, and so we use a different treatment for each different type of those cancers. Once we find out what the gene mutations are inside a cancer, sometimes we can match that exactly to a drug. And in the past, where we would have used chemotherapy, now we can use these molecular targeted therapies, to, um, which are sometimes better tolerated and easier to take, often just a tablet, and that can uh, shrink the cancer or slow it down uh, in uh, a proportion of patients. It's easier to take often than chemotherapy, and now in cancers like lung cancer, um, it's actually more effective as well uh, than, the old, than the chemotherapy. Some cancers, um, we also can use the information we find from testing the gene mutations to pick uh, immunotherapy. And immune therapy works in a different way from chemotherapy and, and, and molecular targeted therapy because it uses the body's own immune system to try to kill the cancer. Um, patients with certain gene mutations, particularly those uh, involved in repairing DNA mistakes, uh, sometimes have a, um, a much higher chance of responding to immune therapies. Immune therapies are new kind of drugs that uh, instead of trying to smash up the cancer cells like chemotherapy does or switch off a gene that's um, falsely activated in, in the cell that allows it to grow in a crazy way, immune therapies um, allow the body's own immune system to attack the cancer. 
Cancer cells are clever um, and they can often evade our immune system and become invisible by becoming invisible to the immune system. And so what these drugs do is, if you imagine a cancer cell sitting in our body with a veil over the top of it, is that these drugs essentially sort of pull back the veil and uh, the immune system says, oh my gosh, I didn't even realise you were there, and then can have a go at it. Um, so uh, the nice thing about that is often the medicines aren't very toxic um, uh, for the majority of people, um, and um, so that they are better tolerated and can be very effective only for the right kinds of cancer and only for those with the right kind of gene changes or the right kind of damage to the, uh, the code that's inside the cell so they can respond to these drugs. Imagine DNA as a really long string of letters and each of those letters is a piece of code. Uh, and if you imagine, there's actually two strands that sit side by side each other. And the chemotherapy sometimes makes those strands tangle on each other so that that long strand can't be read properly or chunks fall out of it, or sometimes it even substitutes fake letters into that strand so that it's, it um, prevents the copying from being perfect. So chemotherapy, the way it works, is that it stops DNA being copied into a new cell. Um, and so effectively it's sort of smashing up the DNA inside the cancer, uh, the cancer cells so that they can't be copied and the cancer therefore can't grow. Molecular targeted therapy is a bit different. It takes the cancer cell, it targets a change on the cancer cell itself or just inside the cancer cell which switches off a growth pathway in that cell so the cell just stops growing and dies. Immune therapy is different again because it doesn't really care about the cancer cell and what's happening inside the cancer cell. It actually just allows the immune system to recognise that it's there and that it shouldn't be there. Uh, and, and, and then uh, attacks it using T cells, which are the immune cells that get rid of viruses, but also cancer cells in our bodies. When we're trying to choose treatment, first thing we think of is where the cancer started. So is it the bowel, the breast, the lung? The next thing increasingly is what gene mutations have driven that cancer, those four or five mistakes. And then we think about what treatment we should pick next. Um, and uh, in the future, and what's happening now is we're starting to realise that other patterns of, of mutations are telling us how to use medicines like immunotherapy as well. Um, and we're also seeing um, that the treatments we give then cr sometimes create new changes uh, in the cancer, or that one of those four or five mutations becomes the dominant problem and it might change over time and so what we hope is we can play chess with the cancer as we get better at this. Precision medicine is still in its infancy and so we're really only still just learning how to use these gene changes and while we've had some real successes in matching gene changes to specific, specific drugs, still a lot of the gene information we find out, those four or five mistakes, we can't do anything with. And for many patients with many types of cancer, gene sequencing won't lead to a specific drug uh, at the moment. What we hope is that over time we can use the information that we find from these uh, inside these cancers to help that person as technology catches up with their problem or sometimes just to help people in the future from that person's experience. I think with precision medicine it's one of those things that sometimes offers people a lot of hope um, and hope is a hard thing because sometimes we do these tests um, and we do find that answer that we're looking for that um, changes our treatment and can make a huge change for the outcome that that person is going to experience in the journey they're going to, going to go through. But sometimes the reality of their cancer is that we just don't understand the gene changes that are in their cancer and how to target it. Um, and we're still working on that and things are changing all the time, but that's a work in progress. And so the outcome for a lot of people of, of precision medicine at this stage is still that we can't tailor their therapy uh, any better than just with chemotherapy. And so many patients going through a cancer journey are still um, going to be bound by using more old-fashioned treatments like chemotherapy. I think one of the hardest parts of the cancer journey is balancing the hope of what might be possible with some of the realities, the things, the, the averages of how things go, the things that people tell you, the other people and family members that you've seen go through this journey and how things have, have turned out for them. And you know that 
there's an expectation about a particular type of cancer and what that f the future of that situation is. But you also hear stories that, of people who've exceeded all ex expectation and, and sometimes have been cured from a cancer that seems incurable. And I think that balancing find that hope and reality, finding a way to still keep hold of that hope that you might be one of those people and yet plan for a future where you might not is the toughest part of a cancer journey in many ways. I share that as an oncologist um, as I go through this journey with my patients because similarly I have an understanding about what tends to happen but we're always looking for what might be possible um, and balancing that hope and reality um, is one of the diff most difficult parts of the journey I go through with the patient. Uh, trying to always look for the next thing and hope for what might be possible and yet being realistic and sharing expectations and helping the patient to prepare for t two or three different possible outcomes at any point in time. A cancer journey often has ups and downs and um, you know I, as an oncologist I look after people in both situations um, and try to provide the support that they need and you know, celebrate the wins but also be there for the harder times as well.